Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Let's Talk Yoga podcast. I hope you are doing well. You'll notice that this episode is dropping on a random day, honestly. That's because I ended up injuring myself last week. It was literally out of the blue. I quite I mean, I just stepped my feet apart, sort of jumped my feet apart and ended up tearing my ACL looks like, probably messed with my meniscus too. So while I'm learning to adapt to this new normal, it has slowed me down quite literally at work. I'm doing great, all things considered. I'm in no pain, thankfully. Inflammation's gone down. I'm just limping around, dragging my leg around. And getting around is challenging. It's uh, honestly, it's frustrating because I'm somebody who has been using my body in a very intense capacity, not just through yoga, right? You know, I have been a professional dancer and I'm, I'm at the gym and I end up walking for miles. I just, I communicate with myself through my body in so many ways. So this new experience is is a lesson. So I'm just taking one moment at a time. Okay. So all things considered, I'm doing well. I'm just a little behind on dropping this podcast. I should be back to a regular programming schedule next week. But uh, looks like the future holds a lot of limping around for sure. And some adjusted teaching schedules for me, moved some stuff around in terms of timelines. And I might be going in for a reconstructive surgery next week. I'll know that in a couple of weeks and then we'll move into recovery from there. So that's uh, it's not the way I plan to start the new year, to say the least, but I'm embracing it. I'm sure there are many interesting insights and lessons in here. Okay, So if any of you out there, I hope not, have torn your ACL and you have any words of advice or, or humor, I'll take that too at this point. Just uh, feel free to reach out. Okay. And on the show today, I was going to do a completely different episode, to be honest. I sat down to script why being reflective is one of the most important qualities a yoga teacher needs to embody and ways to be more reflective and wasn't really feeling it. I, I also think because of this injury, I'm, I'm struggling a little in terms of just, I wouldn't like to say mental health. That's not what it is. I'm just feeling a little frustrated. So I was like, I don't want to talk about reflection right now because while I'm reflecting on my current situation I noticed that it I wasn't feeling the whole emotion behind writing what I wanted to. So I'm going to change topics on you and I'm actually going to talk about Shavasana. Okay and Shavasana has been on my mind more than usual of late and I'm I'm not understanding why. So I was lingering in that space of why am I thinking about Shavasana so much and just putting together content for my 200-hour teacher training, which will be now in September. It will be available online as well. I know some of you have written to me. We're just pushing things out because of this injury. So I was like, let's let's get on the podcast and talk about Shavasana. Now, a couple of things that I want to cover in Shavasana today. Think of this as just a, a free Shavasana masterclass. Okay, I want to talk about the mythological story behind the Shava of Shavasana, the corpse of Shavasana and the reason why it's called the corpse pose and how to set people up, what to look for, the ideal duration of Shavasana, alternates to Shavasana. Why do we roll only to the right side and not the left? What is the significance? What to do if someone's uncomfortable? What to do if somebody's coughing? What to do if someone's pregnant? And what to do if somebody just tends to fall asleep in Shavasana? Okay, The difference between sleep and Shavasana and how to explain Shavasana in a way where people actually take it seriously. So those are just some of the things that I want to talk about in today's episode. It will be a shorter one and I hope you will join me on this little Shavasana exploration. Let's go. Hi, my name is Arundhati and you're listening to the Let's Talk Yoga podcast. I'm an ex-Bollywood dancer turned yoga and wellness educator. I've built a six-figure business as an immigrant, woman of color yoga teacher with no business background, no handstands, pure instinct and the free information found on Google. If you love doing yoga and you dream of teaching it someday, this podcast is for you. We go over everything from doing and teaching yoga to scaling a small business, living a modern yoga lifestyle and so much more. 
you'll find interesting, fun, raw conversations along with some tips, tricks, strategies and insights in this podcast. So grab your cup of chai and let's jump in. So to kick things off, Shavasana is one of the easiest yet hardest poses to do. Okay. I actually feel it is easier to do Shavasana for a lot of people. But we as yoga teachers, we struggle to explain Shavasana or we struggle to get people to really understand the depths of Shavasana. So right at the top, Shavasana is pronounced as Shav Asan or Shav Asana. Shav or Shava is a corpse. Okay. And Shavasana literally means, in English it's translated to as corpse pose and you already know this. But they are basically talking about the rigor mortis, right? How stiff a corpse is, right? And no movement. That is what is being referred to here by the by the yogis who handed this over to us. I personally do not use the word corpse pose in classes only because I do not want it to trigger somebody's memories of seeing a loved one like that. So I've always been sensitive to that. So I don't say corpse pose, but I say Shavasana. Okay, I say, I do not translate this particular name as much as I do with some of the others. But I, I talk about it being called Shavasana, a resting pose. And I'll tell you a little more at the end of the episode of how I teach it to others and how I contextualize it. But know that it literally means you're trying to lie there like a corpse, right? And there is a note of Pratyahara in Shavasana where your senses are withdrawing and hence you are literally dead to the world outside, okay? And you're in this place of deep bliss and rest and restoration, okay? So there are a few different references to Shavasana. Some of the mythological references are in the Shatka mythology or it's also known as the mythology of the goddess, Shiva. Okay, Lord Shiva is actually a dead body. He's actually a Shava. Okay, and the only time life comes into Shiva is when Goddess Kali comes and dances on him. And without the Goddess dancing on him, he has no life. So she brings the life into him. Okay, and this kind of is trying to, the story here is trying to embody the dichotomy between the mind and matter. And matter without spirit or soul. That's kind of what this mythological story is referring to. When the soul enters the body, it becomes alive. And it experiences all human experiences and sensory experiences. And the soul itself is disembodied. right? And without the body, it has no form. And Shiva is considered to be a Bhuta. Okay, Bhuta means ghost, and he's one of his names is also Bhuteshwara. Okay, and essentially that means the spirit without substance or matter. And the goddess is believed to be. Then this is fascinating to me. The goddess is believed to be the substance without spirit. Okay, and it's only when the two come together that life is actually created. Okay, so Shava becomes Shiva in this mythological story, Shava becomes Shiva only when the goddess intervenes. Okay. And in 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 Hindu mythology and spirituality, as a zoomed out, if you take a zoomed out look, there is this constant conversation about what is superior? Is it spirit or is it matter? Did matter come first or did spirit come first? And who created whom Okay, and there is always a tug of war between the two. But it's very significant that the spirit is given a masculine form while the body is given the feminine form. Okay, in, 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 in Hindu mythology, the female metaphor represents material reality, everything that is bound by space and time and everything that has a form and a name and maybe even a boundary and the disembodied life force imagination consciousness etc is represented through the masculine metaphors okay and these masculine metaphors defy the limits of space and time and you know we can imagine the past the future without actually being in them so essentially shavasana is is this the mythology says that it is this mingling 
of the masculine and feminine, the matter and the spirit coming together. And while the mythological story is romanticized in some ways, according to me, in our modern day, Shavasana is a very practical tool for our nervous system, for our bodies, for our brains, for our cardiovascular health, for so many physical reasons alone. Okay, That practicing Shavasana as a lifestyle or yoga practice is very important. And I feel like if we as yoga teachers are really convinced about the importance of this practice, then we can communicate the relevance of this to our students a lot more. Okay, so that's kind of a quick look into the mythology of Shava in Shavasana. Okay, and I'm not going to spend too much time here explaining on the podcast how to set people up in Shavasana. I'm assuming most of you already teach yoga or are long-time yoga students. So you are pretty well versed in setting up for Shavasana. Some of the things I would like to call out here for you to check with your students are Make sure the back of the neck is always supported, okay? The back of the neck and the back of the head, okay? This will help induce their relaxation response a lot faster. It supports the vagus nerve and that is deeply connected to our ability to rest and digest. So even if, if you have one blanket in Shavasana, put it under your head and your neck, okay? You could substitute the blanket for a cushion as well, but essentially not letting your head just be on a hard surface if you can help it, okay? Make sure the head is straight. So it's not like when we're asleep where the head rolls off to one side. You want the head to be straight. I often say the nose in line with the navel or the chin in line with the navel is what you're looking for, okay? The second thing I would add here is if you have additional props, then make sure you support the backs of the knees. That always gives you a little extra lower back support, you could also have, I love this personally, I feel cold in Shavasana. My body temperature tends to drop very quickly. So I always need a blanket or socks or a hoodie, something to cover my feet and my hands. And I love doing Shavasana. I feel so cocooned with a blanket. So make sure if you have these props, you use them. I like to cover my eyes with a towel or with a yoga strap if nothing else is available, a jacket sleeve. And if you are practicing in a bright room, then the lights coming, turning off is a good idea. At the studio, we have it dim the lights down for all Shavasanas. We take people's glasses off so their facial muscles can release and just letting the entire body in many ways just sink and melt into the ground. Okay. Now, so that's, there's more of how you set people up. If you want me to get into that, then let me know. I will send you some stuff on the newsletter of how to set people up in Shavasana. Okay, but let's jump straight into the duration of Shavasana. Okay, now is there an ideal duration? I want you to pause and think about that for a moment. And I actually want you to open your phone and send me an Instagram message even before you hear the answer. What, according to you, is the ideal duration for Shavasana? Okay, so hit pause right now and send me a quick note on Instagram just so we can engage a little more in. Well, I'm doing air quotes. You can't see it real time. But how? what is ideal Shavasana time? All right. I'm assuming you have done that. Now, there is no ideal anything in yoga, to be honest. Okay. Because ideal itself is subjective. But there are a few markers here that you could use. Okay. For example, if you are teaching a 60-minute class, Shavasana should be about 10 minutes long. If you are teaching a 75-minute class, Shavasana should be about 15 minutes long. Okay. If you are teaching a 90-minute or greater class, then Shavasana should at least be 20 minutes. Okay. Now, if it's a 45-minute practice, then 5 minutes of Shavasana and so on. So essentially, 60 minutes, 10 minutes Shavasana. 75 minutes, 15 minutes, 90 minutes, 20. And the more you spend time in asana, just you add a little more buffer into your shavasana. Okay. Now, remember, we do shavasana not because, and I explain this to my classes all the time. We do shavasana not because we are physically tired from asana. Yes, you might, I tell my clients this, you might be tired from other things in life. 
and you might be showing up to your mat already either physically tired or mentally tired or both sometimes none okay and that influences how you experience everything in yoga class including shavasana okay so we don't do shavasana because we are tired from the i'm doing air quotes here working out in yoga and i know you understand what i mean by that or i hope you understand what i mean by that we do shavasana because it is a reset it is a reset for the nervous system it is a moment to let our senses withdraw into pratyahara sensory withdrawal okay it is a moment of disengaging with the outer world and that deep rest will recharge you okay so that's why we do shavasana and it's important to to recognize our attitude of constantly wanting to do more in yoga class like in asana terms and to step away from that and know that that's there tomorrow but to take care of our nervous system our brains our heart our circulation and all the other sensory organs okay so that's one aspect of shavasana do you need to speak throughout shavasana not necessarily you need to set people up make sure they're comfortable adjust the room environment tell them all that they need to know and then being quiet in shavasana is great so then their pratyahara where their senses withdraw can actually kick into action now to come out of shavasana when the time's up you usually you bend your knees you roll to the right side okay make sure you hear that you roll to the right side i recently put up an instagram reel about this as well okay you only roll to the right side in shavasana for a few main reasons the first and the most significant reason being it's got to do with your nasal passages okay now remember this your right armpit opens your left nostril your left armpit opens your right nostril okay i'm going to say that again slightly differently this time pressing down on the right armpit activates your ida nadi which is your lunar channel which is located in your left nasal passage pressing down on the left armpit activates your pingala nadi which is your solar channel and is located in the right nasal passage okay so the whole reason why we roll to the right side in shavasana and hear this we stay there resting on our right side pressing down on our right armpit we stay there in that cocoon position for a for a certain duration we activate the ida nadi okay which is the which triggers the parasympathetic nervous system and is responsible for keeping us calmer more relaxed and is a wonderful transition okay to come out of shavasana which is why we roll to the right side another reason is everything auspicious in indian culture and yoga is from indian culture is initiated with the right side of your body especially your right hand is initiated with the right side of your body especially your right hand for example in india when you go to a store and you pay the storekeeper if you pay him with your left hand they usually will ask you to switch and do it with your right hand because it's considered that anything auspicious anything good is initiated with your right side whereas the left hand is used for more crooked behaviors and all inauspicious things actually happen with your left side for the longest time and i know i believe this even today that if you're having a bad day they used to tell us when we were younger oh did you wake up on your left side <laughs> okay so till date i roll to the right side and wake up from my right side it's a superstition this one probably is a superstition but i i still believe it and roll to the right side and start my day like that okay and then they also say there is less pressure on the heart and stuff like that when you roll to your right side okay so just remember the main reason is it activates your ida nadi which is your lunar channel and if you've heard our pranayama episodes on the show before we've spoken a lot about the nostril dominance and the switching of the nostrils and a whole lot of pranayama stuff so we roll to the right side because of this reason okay and sometimes you'll notice people will have will start coughing in shavasana in that case just roll them to the right side or and make them do side shavasana or ask them to sit up or give them a bolster reclining type of shavasana if you're familiar with that okay couple of more things here before i wrap this quick episode up is what if a student falls asleep in shavasana 
Okay, it's totally fine. It just means that they are very tired. They are physically tired, mentally tired, maybe both. They only relate to lying down and sleeping. That's how it, the only time we're in that position is when we're sleeping, right? So just reminding them to get enough sleep and to rest enough so they can stay up. I sometimes use a little more instructions and guided relaxation if I notice someone tends to fall asleep very quickly. But usually, I've noticed a lot of my male students tend to just zone out and fall asleep more than the female students. I just think it's how we're built a little bit. But if someone falls asleep in Shavasana, just remember that they need to, they're deeply tired, okay? And to help restore them even in their asana the best way you can. And the last thing I would say here is make sure you explain Shavasana well to your students. Okay, You don't have to do a whole podcast episode on it like I am right now, but just explain to them that it's for their nervous system. It has nothing to do with them being physically tired and it's a deep practice of yoga to let your senses rest even briefly and that they'll come out of it feeling so rejuvenated and that yes, the mind will probably be distracting them. In that case, I give them the option to watch their breath at their belly and to use that as an anchor and to do some long exhalations to settle in. When the student is new to asana, I keep their shavasanas short. As the student develops a liking for asana and this feels less alien to them, then I indulge them in different restorative versions of shavasana and I start increasing the duration. I do a rotation of awareness over time, but I don't open the floodgates on day one. I slowly ease them into it, if that makes sense. Okay, that way they're not just there feeling awkward and obligated to just lie there and wait for class to get over. If somebody is constantly fidgeting in your Shavasana, they are probably uncomfortable or they've not had enough energy output in their Asana. Okay, so I would look at those two elements a lot more. So I think I'm going to wrap it up here for this very random Shavasana episode. Honestly, my life feels a little random right now with this new injury. My routine's all over the place. So I'm a little, I'm getting used to it. I'm trying to figure out what this new normal looks like. And hence this uh, out of the blue Shavasana episode for you. I do hope it is helpful. I have been trying to script or re-script my 200 hour that's coming up in September. And I will be dropping a lot of these smaller topics for you, hoping that it helps. And the only way I know that it will help is if you tell me that you want more of this, you want them to be more detailed, or if there are certain topics you want me to talk about. And you can do that by just reaching out to me on Instagram or replying to our newsletters. Make sure you're signed up for those. And uh, as always, thank you for being here. Thank you for being curious and learning with humility. I hope that our conversations here, solo guest conversations, they help you. It would be wonderful if you could take a moment to review and rate this podcast. It's the only way we know that this content is beneficial and it also recharges my batteries to give you more of this. Okay, so you can do that on Apple Podcasts. You can even rate us on Spotify. You could tag us on your stories and share it with your yoga community and any other way that you want to get creative. It means a lot that you are here every week. I will be back here next week with another guest and a conversation lined up for you. Until then, take care. Bye-bye.